poor little Zendaya is so sad because she wants an egalitarian relationship and she likes Paul because he's, this is, and I can, I can just pop off here and say that there's something really funny in Zendaya's character, but that she likes him because he's the one she can be in a relationship with him because he doesn't believe that he's the one mm. she likes him because he has actually has all the character traits and the strength and the abilities that are required to be <laughs> the one as long as he doesn't believe that he is because then he's just into himself he's I, just being I, into himself and she's mad her and character was so bad <laughs> i i was was it though people have complained about it I th- I think, I th- let me just say, bad to what end? Met a ghost of a king on the road when I first fell. Fire burning to my knees, to my knees I fell. Met a ghost of a king on a road. I hear that uh, we are on course for another airplane story. Uh, are so. we? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, post vacation, there's not a lot to talk about, <laughs> except apparently all the movies dropped that uh, I yeah, guess we, we watch we, on an airplane. We have a. We have, um, Basically, this could be like a movie mop up because we referred yep. to a number of them: Cabrini's in theaters, Boys in the Boats, now available on the home home video, as they say. I've uh, been, I've been shouting Dune, everything I can remember from Dune, 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 to Dune from Denis Villeneuve all over. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Dune, the Maker series is coming here. Yep, to Canon soon. Plus. Canon Plus. I'm sure you saw that uh, with Doug Ten Naple. Yep, and then, um, so yeah, we got like movie mop-up, and then I was off tromping around Mayan ruins a little bit. Wow. And sprinting through SeaTac. I think that's... <laughs> like SeaTac, Mayan ruins are for leisure, SeaTac is for the sprint. SeaTac was for getting home, the getting, the getting home phase. And well, just was- another reminder that the wheels are coming off literally everywhere Yeah, in our economy. It's... Sometimes they're coming off of airplanes as they take off. Yeah. And bouncing through parking lots. And sometimes they're just coming off metaphorically. Right. Which is what I was dealing with. And it's just everywhere. Like yeah. pieces are literally falling off of airplanes. As my son said, if you can imagine a sign of social decay, just conjure one up in your head. It's probably already happened. Yeah. A wheel falling off a plane. That's a doors falling off of planes, yeah. wheels falling off of planes. United Airlines having to send out a, a CEO note about how their planes are falling apart in midair. But you know, bear with us. Par- <laughs> pardon our dust. There's so many videos. <laughs> pardon our dust. People just looking out the window and seeing missing bolts or things leaking out of the plane. It's, it's, it's just <laughs> wild right now. And of course, that's how it's working politically for us. It's working that way in terms of entertainment. It's working that way yeah. all over the place. People are just we, in the shakedown. Like we're all in the composter right now. We are yeah, definitely we've talked in about, here with the red worms and the raw eggs and we're composting hardcore. Right. You need those tiger worms though. It's not just the regular earthworms <laughs> that can yeah. do the composting. <laughs> uh, yes. I remember reading an article on that as a kid and being like, I got to get some of those worms. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get some of the, got to get me some of them worms for, yeah. sh- for sure. Uh, bucket list creature. I don't know if you've seen one, but the Palouse giant earthworm. Have you seen any of those? Yeah. You found one? No, not I've not seen them like in my backyard. Seen them, right? Okay, uh, at, a, not, at the I've un- not at the university. Found them. I just I just hear the tremors as they pass underneath me. Wow, Dune style. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know, a two or three foot earthworm would be almost as cool to me as Shy Halud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're big. Uh, uh, I believe, those are the babies, the two to three footers, the okay. thirty four footers are the real, wow. the real blue giant earthworms. See, and they have in a the smell. mythologies of of what I just made up. They have a smell of lilac, I believe, is what I've heard. They smell like lilac. <laughs> that, that's what I heard. That explains is... my allergies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always. But anyways, they all think we're. There's joking. a story about a small boy who, everywhere he walked, he was followed by a pack of giant blue earthworms, but never knew because they were all just <laughs> under every footstep. Yeah, rippling. Right, and it's not sand, so you can't. I don't know. You can't yeah, see you the can't track. really grappling hook them. Right, and. And ride. They're also not that predatory, so now, that we know. Either that, or they're very effective, <laughs> extremely efficient. Right. Anyways, we're joking about some of that, but not all of it. And you have to figure out what <laughs> is true. Um, yes, yeah, some of that was AI generated. 
But yeah, no. I asked AI and said, just guess, just predict what would we have in the Palouse? And they said a giant earthworm. Mm. All the robots came up with that. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we covering today, Brian? Actually. <sighs> yeah. I mean, we're I back think, from I vacation. Did covering... you vacation? Did I just vacation? No, I, I, we did a very quick vacation up to Coeur okay. spent basically 12 hours in a pool with all of my children and... 12 hours in a pool. Yeah. A novel. Right. That's, <laughs> yeah. The, when you get the uh, 10 and 8-year-old boys to like actually get out of the pool, when you say, hey, get out of the pool because they're so tired, that's when you know you've achieved <laughs> vacation success. They're not like, oh, dad, let's do one more game. They're just like rats slowly sinking out of the <laughs> pool back to the hotel room. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. So my vacation <laughs> consisted of a lot of amazing food, sleep, and work. Getting work done. Interesting. Which I is funny. That's kind of a vacation now. <laughs> yeah. No soul food. That's the vacation. That's, uh, that's what it really yeah. was. Well, a little vacation from the podcast. What's the takeaway from the Mayan ruins, though? Did you feel like you wrote... You didn't write Mayan ruins into Outlaws. You had Aztec. There's so much in the Western Hemisphere that's just insane. So... Yeah. Uh, fully, fully insane. And to kind of flash back and look at just like try to glimpse Europe and glimpse the new world. It's, you know, kind of ridiculous that the bigger, more effective empires were in the new world. Yeah. And it's, you know, the Inca is incredible. Cause you're thinking post Roman empire. Yeah. We jump over to the big ones that lasted. Yeah. There's all the centuries there's, yeah. or Incans. Mayans. So we don't, you don't really get into uh, post Christendom, right? And by Christendom, I mean the Holy Roman Empire. You mm -hmm. know, it's like sort of the, what, what Constantine ushered in and what we dealt with, you mm -hmm. know, in all the aftermath post, post that. You don't really see the modern imperial states coming into existence until the Reformation and the fracturing of loyalty to Rome. Mm -hmm. And so you see England and France and Spain and, you know, everybody's doing their thing. Meanwhile, there's in the far East, there are these incredible dynasties, but in the West, if you're starting in Europe to their East and to their West were incredible, massive dynastic operations. Hmm. And it's, it's truly incredible. I mean, where we were was Maya, but yeah, the Aztec, uh, were a thing, obviously, but they were kind of a short-lived thing, as um, you'd assume from something so violent. And but that's the weird part. You, we know about we know about how bloody and violent the Aztecs were, but the the Maya were no cupcakes. Mm. You know, it's unfortunately I only know about them from Age of Empires, so <laughs> that's the sad part of it. So <laughs> when you go, like we went to Chichen Itza, which is one of these really famous sites, and I'll I'll say a couple of things here. One is you go out into the jungle and you go to the literal middle of nowhere. Mm. This is not on a strategic point. This is not a mountain. This is not a harbor. This is just where there, it was near three cenote, you know, underwater river cave systems. It was near the mouths of three cenotes. Mm. Um, and the different tribes had their sacred cenotes, you know, their, their entry points. So they, the, they built, there it was conquered once then they built a big castillo you know in the middle but you you show up and you are looking at the largest ball court you know those hoop games right. um in you know in the western hemisphere which is just or i i trying to think who might be bigger it might just be in central america there might be one somewhere else but a giant one it's mm -hmm. a really giant ball court and you kind of walk around and you look at the the altars where they would sacrifice the people <laughs> and and then you look at the complexity of uh, the complexity of the central pyramid and what it does, you know, as they're describing the shadow, the shadow art it was designed to create on the solstices. Mm -hmm. So it actually does a quetzalcoatl, like wriggling quetzalcoatl in the solstices or some, you know, feathered serpent thing. Wow. Um, and that it even acoustically was designed to imitate the bird call of some sacred bird to the 
to the Maya, if you clap at its base, it breaks your clap. The echo is broken and it becomes this bird warble. Does that still work? Yeah. And it's like, okay, so we have acoustic design. We've got shadow design. We're doing the solstice obsessed stuff. Yeah. Just like you see solstice obsessed stuff anywhere in the world. Yeah. You see it in the Orkneys. You get all the way up to Mays Howe, one of the cooler places I've ever been. And it's designed for the solstices. And down yeah. here uh, in Egypt, in Mexico, it's designed for the solstices. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I was taking my kids around and I told them, I was like, imagine in 2350, some dad taking his kids on a tour of some death camp in Germany. Mm -hmm. And they have all the doodads and trinkets and skulls and everything all on plastic for you to buy. Uh, at the death camps, you mm. know, like that's kind of what we're dealing with here. This was a blood religion mm. and this is this big platform of skulls. There's this huge, and this is where it occurred to me. There's this massive platform of skulls and it was built entirely to display the heads of victims. And it's pretty tall. It's not like a giant thing, but it's a, you know, it's my height and it's got rows and rows, maybe a little taller, but rows all the way around it of bricks Every single brick has been carved in the shape of a skull, has a relief of a skull on it, and in uh, varying stages of de of decomposing all the way around it. So mm, out of it's, brick. Se it's severed head. Just it's a relief on the stone. So oh, this, right. so they carved it in relief on the stone, and there's the severed head that's not quite you know, it's just rotting over time. You can go around, and the heads are all decomposing and this is where they would platform these long poles that were just decorated like christmas trees with heads severed heads and then the you know the human sacrificial altars and you're like oh and this is the non-bloody these are not the bloody people from this area oh right like these are <laughs> this is the maya these are the peace loving hippies of this whole <laughs> of this whole region yeah uh which is crazy but then if you get to the inca their road system and their stonework and everything they did, building roads everywhere, uh, is very Roman and in incredible. Uh, and then they, I really don't know that the Spaniards would have successfully taken the Inca if they'd really mm. uh, hadn't had smallpox on their side. <laughs> right. Like, I just, they couldn't handle the terrain. It was, there was so much strategic disadvantage. But the Mayan ruins, I'm sitting here telling my kids, it's like, this is like hundreds of years from now, people selling Nazi doodads, selling, you know, the little SS symbol and, the, you know, the skull and, and mm -hmm. everything else. Like, this was awful. This was her, just absolutely awful. Now, it's also incredible, super impressive, right. amazing, uh, this incredible city just because they, they were near three cave entrances. And that's why this whole thing's here. Uh, but it's also just dead. Yeah. It's this exoskeleton. It's like finding a conch shell. Mm. You know, there's this exoskeleton of a, of a civilization of a people. And it made me wonder what we're going to leave because we are absolutely 100% in that tiger worm phase. <laughs> like we're, <laughs> I mean, look at our airlines, our flying machines, you know, like we've peaked. Yeah. We're, we've done some amazing things. Our managerial class has squeezed all of the dollars out, and all of yeah. a sudden, we found out we lost the people who are making the things. <laughs> yeah, so I had enough. I had enough sleep and enough ceviche to have have some nice uh, contemplative times. But the ruins were really striking. Yeah. Just really, really striking. Just a mortality reminder for yeah, a people. from an incredible civilization. Like yeah. just what they accomplished is insane. And what happened? Um. Uh, and yeah. Tulum, just south of where we were, just north of where we were, actually, I think, somewhere just just next just to where close. we were, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somewhere just next to us. Uh, Tulum is this other site of ruins, and one of the things that was enjoyable about it, the most enjoyable about it, is it's these cliff sides, you know, buildings. They had some towers and stuff above a harbor, and apparently the Spaniards showed up here. This was their point of contact. Uh, with the mainland, they'd gone through the islands and dealt with some Caribs, you know, dealt with some, some of the tribes and more primitive civilizations. And then they floated up and saw this stone complex. Yeah. Huge on the cliff and thought, Hmm. And they sailed away. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, 
wait, this, this is something else. This, this is this is much bigger. Yeah, yeah, this is much bigger. And luckily, we've brought our diseases with us. Yeah. So hand out the blankets. <laughs> yeah. Um, it really what basically the the ruins are incredible and they're ama- they're amazing. But it's also it made me think a lot about politics and uh, the U.S. and decay because driving. I had to go to Seattle to get my passport, and it was a whole thing uh, before we left. And driving back through the the mountains, it, it's kind of amazing that we see it. We're surrounded by mountains here. There's a lot of mountains, but mountains are always falling down. They're crumbling. They have landslides. And conservatives are like the people who are all fighting to save the mountain. Like mm-hmm. they're all just tending the mountain as it just decays, as it washes away as it sends down its avalanches and rubble. But nobody really thinks about the, the inevitable times when mountains have to be made. Hmm. Like there are these punctuated moments in time when mountains get heaped up, when the volcanoes go, you know, when the earthquakes really slam, those are your world war two phases. Those are your big cataclysmic geopolitical earthquakes and so on. And then after the fact, conservatives just don't want the mountain to decay any more than it already has. Yeah. They have no strategy for rebuilding a mountain. You know, they can, you can't collect all the gravel and put it back on. You know, it's like, it's just not going to work. Uh, but I, I really do think that we're kind of overdue. For some mountain building. I think we're overdue for some, some significant shakeups. And that's part of what I've said about composting, you know, cultures compost and then there's explosive growth yeah. uh, out of the, out of the compost. But looking around at the Maya, you know, yeah. Empire and looking at these empires, looking at these things. And there's these outside the system shock waves that just, you know, took them out. Yeah. Just overthrow it. But the he, same similar things happen. Like when Luther, you know, what, did, what ended, what ended quote unquote Christendom? a centralized power, you know, through Western Europe, the printing press and well, yeah, a, a, a dude with a piece of paper. Yeah. A mountain, like just, just one thing. And then the, all the shakeup starts, the big tumult starts and uh, the reformed princes and the reformation and Anglican church and all this stuff starts shaking. Uh, where before it's like Eastern, Western, you know, the Orthodox, the Catholics. Yeah. And that was it. Well, this, this uh, story of shakeup and how individuals find their lives blended into a bigger purpose does yeah. sound like Dune. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And uh, Masters uh, of the Air. Right. You know, if we're going to tie another content, a uh, bomber group show on Apple. On VidAngel, by the way, worth filtering. Uh, but think about what was going on in Europe and mm-hmm. how just psycho World War II was. Yeah, what and a then crazy it, time. And then it left us with a new status quo, which we decided was a status quo, like really quick. This is the status quo. Yeah. And then now, you know, all the grinding of the gears still uh, post that. And Dune is, uh, I think, very successfully captures the big grinding glacial movements that uh, create real shakeup. Right. Well, I was I was curious what you thought about. Obviously, we've talked a lot about how prophecy becomes, like how Tamar and others were active. We think think yeah. are actively tracking prophecies throughout time. Yep. In a way that Frank Herbert is clearly trying to overtly say, I think prophecies are both created and somehow not. I guess I was curious what your created thought is. and lived. Yeah. yeah. But very much, you know, Paul becoming what what he was sort of is both his action of choosing to become it and then also the fact that where he's put in history and then also the belief of this you know tribesman i was curious what 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 do you think's going on there it felt it felt like it's i think the energy of dune is very old testament in a way that yeah. is, is surprising to people and and enjoyable um and perhaps feels of one piece of fabric there's so many things there that People knee jerk. People talk about the Islamic influences. Yeah. You know, in the film. And they're kind of absent. You know, apart from costumery. Yep. You know, it is And that Lisa on Al Gaib sounds kind of Muslim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so it's like there's decor. Right. It there's some decor here. But then they have a lot of weird tech. Yeah. Uh, and 
it's an egalitarian society. Yeah. And so it's, that's not, <laughs> I mean, that, that's not what we're, <laughs> that's not the people of, uh, well, I was reading and, about, and poor little Zendaya is so sad because she wants an egalitarian relationship and she likes Paul because he's, this is, and I can, I can just pop off here and say that there's something really funny in Zendaya's character, but that she likes him because he's the one she can be in a relationship with him because he doesn't believe that he's the one mm. she likes him because he has actually has all the character traits and the strength and the abilities that are required to be <laughs> the one as long as he doesn't believe that he is because then he's just into himself. He's I, just being I, into himself and she's mad. Her and character was so bad. <laughs> I, I was, was it though? People have complained about it. I, I, think, I, I, I Let me just say bad to what end? Uh, I think that, she didn't fit in that story. That chick who just is ticked off about him like stepping up. Well, I, I, what, what to me I felt like is just uh, air dropping a modern girl into this story that felt like it needed, you know, concubines are nothing new in the Dune world. And in the actual story, I think she has a kid with Paul. No, she'll get invited to the harem for sure. Right. But that sort of, I guess, I suppose, letting her be frustrated about that. But uh, Paul's mom is a concubine of Leto. Like that whole situation to me just didn't make sense that she was so naive about power structure and how power works. And then also I didn't like that she did it with a kind of like pouty face for the whole <laughs> two hours of the movie. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, I, let's just go ahead and say she could have been more interesting. But the the fact is i think their dynamic is underexploited and okay. her self contradictory dynamic is very real okay and it is a very real thing people resent are attracted to and resent things all the time yeah and so she wants this egalitarian relationship she wants this relationship with this dude who does not believe in himself and never steps up because if he steps up, he's going to rule. And the Fremen will no longer be this egalitarian people. They'll have this, yeah, you know, this one. There will be a ruler in a new and complete way. She is a conservative in that she's trying to preserve the mountain. Hmm. And the mountain is Fre the Fremen people. The mountain is the way it has been. Yeah. Trying to preserve the way it has been. And then, of course, she's got, you have these other characters where you are, really excited they're pumped to see a new mountain yeah stillgar i would follow stillgar into battle yeah that guy was exactly awesome. he's great and and you <laughs> and he's so thrilled and excited to see all the old ways yeah get thrown off and a new mountain rise and this is incidentally this is what the pharisees struggled with this is what all sorts of people this is what denethor struggles with you know where you have somebody who's tending the promise yeah and then the, it becomes about the unfulfilled promise as opposed to the fulfillment, the fulfillment. Hmm. So if you have been gardening with your ancestors generationally, one direction, and then it's all you're, you're saying someday this giant King will erupt out of this garden and the whole garden will be uh, just gone. Yeah. You know, it'll be obliterated. Then suddenly that happens it's there's a ton of resentment of the destruction of the status quo, the destruction of the way it was. So even though her people were oppressed, they were themselves. Yeah. It right. was a certain way. Okay. And despite that, it was a certain way. So the dude shows up, she's attracted to him for all the reasons that start to cause uh, Stilgar to believe he's the one she's attracted to him for those same reasons but she can only be in the relationship with him as long as he's full of self-doubt, as long as he doesn't believe the prophecies, as long as he's not going to rise up, as long as he's going to be your equal, as long as he can become Fremen, as long as the Fremen don't change. Mm. And instead, he's going to be this eruption of an entirely new power structure that's going to overhaul her people. It seemed much flatter to me than that. You're making it sound too good, Nate. <laughs> no, it is. Her, there's it like I, I didn't like her snarky group of girlfriends kind of laughing at the prophecy versus these sort of... Stilgar making fun of him or the movie making fun so of him. So this is this is an example where as a as a storyteller I would see people circling things saying delete and I'd be saying expand. Okay. It needs more. 
Okay. So the Northern girls snarking and not believing versus the Southern fundamentalists. Yeah. The thing I hated about that was the word fundamentalist. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That was so yeah. anachronistic and it didn't make any sense to me. Right. They needed to call it something they're else. Because all, they're all fundamentalists. But having, <laughs> but yeah, but having, re, having a regional divide yeah. was really interesting that they're really, they're true believers. Okay. And then up here, we're all kind of, we've yeah. been in the blast radius of the empire. And so we're all more jaded and secular. Mm. That's interesting. And that's very real. You know, yeah. that's the kind of thing that happens. Um, but it's so flippantly and shallowly touched on. Gotcha. Um, and then with with her, I thought, for example, there's an opportunity where to, to have Paul make a choice when he goes to drink the poison. Uh, you could have Paul make an actual decision contra his, you know, his girlfriend. Mm. Where she's saying, don't do it. Because for him to do that is to take a step in faith that he's actually the one. Yeah. The one. Otherwise, he's going to die. And for him to know her name, have known her real name, and to know the prophecy and know that that will put a burden on her to bring him back, it'll be up to her to bring him back or let him stay dead. Hmm. And to push his chips in on that could have been very, very interesting. Okay, and instead force, they and to kinda, force her hand. They kind of unzip the two of the narratives, and so it yeah, accidental. and it becomes a little Deus Ex Machina, where it's just like, oh, phew, good thing she coincidentally happened to be here, and coincidentally happened to be named this, and she couldn't cry right now, right? Um, you know, it's like <laughs> okay, it's, I see. I so see. that if he had actually done that, and that's him stepping away from her, and also requ requiring, forcing her to assist him in that, mm -hmm. which would be something she would not forgive. And yeah. would not want, as opposed to now, it's just like, wait, she, he came back. Why is she mad? Yeah. You know, and so yeah. I think there's all these little, okay. there are these unexploited things, but as a character, it's a complex thing that people have. Yeah. It's really, it's really complicated. Well, I guess maybe, maybe this is what you're touching on, but you remember when one of the Northern girl Fremen gets flamethrowed by, uh, by the guy in the cave, you know, it's mm, supposed to be, yeah. yeah. And we don't really care a whole lot, but we would have cared if it had been Stilgar perhaps, or one of the other guys. Yeah. I don't know. That moment to me felt kind of encapsulated everything that I was wishing was more. Yeah. Cause I did enjoy it obviously, but I remember yeah. watching that and be like, oh, I'm supposed to care, but she and her, what she's standing for just seems really annoying in this yep. and underdeveloped and yeah. a bit fake. So I think the, there's lots of mood and atmosphere and it's very mood and atmosphere heavy. Yeah. Uh, it could have done with more uh, dilemmas, with more horns, like clear, okay. like you know, clear horns of a dilemma situations for characters. So Zendaya's character has taken a beating critically. Yeah. Uh, you know, people complain about it, and I actually think that most people are missing. Okay. Uh, so it's not that she's unrealistic, or yeah. could have been unrealistic. It's that. They didn't do enough of it. It's the expand thing. And that's the kind of mistake that could have just happened in the editing room. Like that's actually, that could be an editorial mistake. That could be an editorial decision in post-production mm. where certain lines and moments are thrown on the cutting room floor. And they give her depth and yeah, give her and they, a and little they think bit more. They're sort of like, man, okay, we have enough here. It lands. It lands. It doesn't. We have one reference to the meaning of her name and then she choppers in real fast. Yeah, and there's so, a moment of tension as we're like, uh oh, is he going so, to die? Well, clearly not. <laughs> yeah, and so, but that that tells me that there was okay. There's a thread that split them, and he made a choice. And there's a scene missing between the two of them when he forces her hand by taking a step towards the fulfillment mm -hmm. of the prophecy that she hates and doesn't believe in, and uh, and hilariously reveals that she hates it more than she doesn't believe in it. He does every single thing. He clearly is the one. He's clearly the fulfillment of it and still ticks her off. Right. It's not about unbelief. It's about resenting the shattering of the old way and the replacement of it with a new mountain. And and didn't they kind of make it cheaper by making it about the other princess at the end? Like no. I, you, I mean, no. you think that fits for yeah, for I think, Johnny? <laughs> I think it, I think that works. It just also I would love for there to be just another beat with her. Not him walking over to her in a crowd saying, I'll always love you. And I'm going to propose to her now. Although I like and that exchange. She, she catches the next sandworm. <laughs> yeah. And, but see, the, the big thing there is what she wanted and what he said he wanted was, he said, I would love to be equals with you. 
And that's what she wanted. Yeah. Okay. She wanted this equality. She wanted this, uh, you know, mm -hmm. egalitarian structure with a fellow Fremen warrior. Yeah. That she thought was cute. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking. Yeah. Okay. So two directions to go with that. I've Paul being, you know, like Timothy Chalamet being the character. He Timothy is. Chalamet. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Villeneuve. <laughs> yes. Um, mm. Dune. <laughs> uh, as far Part as do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The French version. Um, <laughs> as, as far as that's concerned, do you, you saying it needs more dilemmas as I, I've heard, heard it also being, you know, attacked for being too straightforward. Yeah, like, moments like, of choice. Yeah. There, need, there need to be clear moments of choice. So there's this whole pressure that's going on of, is he the one, is he not the one? Mm. Is he the one, is he not the one? He makes his big choice when he goes and drinks the poison. Yeah, And it's, it's, it's sort of not, well, it's just not set up that way. It doesn't have like a, a breaker switch of a choice. Like a, you know, it's like we kind of ease into it. Yeah. Be and then much he, better. when he speaks to the whole room full, that's where you really see him own like that huge room of Fremen. Yeah. That's where you see him own the one yep. and, you know, change yep. the rules instead and of the killing And the someone. feminists were all mad, and there's a, quite a few of them, are mad because he uh, abandons this egalitarian Disney love with his first girlfriend mm -hmm. to pursue his true destiny. He ignores his mom and rolls hard in that scene. Yeah. with the Fremen and she's like slow down and he's, he's just like, like let's go and he's like throttle up <laughs> and he goes harder yeah. and then he even like you know just voice of power smacks in a very moment a great moment of catharsis uh the reverend mother oh so good just yeah. like oh shut up woman we're sick of you and we've never says, seen blasphemy that. yeah it's like <laughs> you know like, yeah um so it's those things like he crushes yeah in different ways and to different degrees, crushes and or just abandons and overrules all the women in his life as he goes <laughs> in in his messianic direction. And that's that has uh, not gone unnoticed in the age of Barbie. But his mom won. She got him. Kind of. She got him exactly where she wanted him, kept him alive. Kind of. Set up the baby sister. So, I mean, that was awesome. Yeah. Too. But yeah, his mom wins. Right. But his mom wins because she loves him and she wants him to, you know, to do this. Yeah. She also doesn't win because she's taken on like centuries of suffering of this people that she doesn't care well, about. Well, yeah, she's she lost her identity. He's yeah. searching for his and she completely lost hers. Yeah, she gets and just, so it is interesting to watch that. Yeah. So she makes this massive sacrifice for the sake of her son and what she believes to be his destiny, even though her sect is yeah. not on that side and has no sides and is supposed to be remaining neutral so she wins but she doesn't get to steer him the way that she thinks she's going to steer him um uh, the outcome is what she wants um and it's a little bit i mean this is so it's, it's a long way away from this but this is a little bit of the wedding in cana where okay, whoa our, where our transition our where you see him just saying like gune like woman yeah it's not my time and then he still does it and there's this, there's this dynamic of mom believer, mm -hmm. like the mom believer who's there way before anybody else, uh, and the son who's going to time things his way. Hmm. And even when she gets her way, like in, in a moment, which she does in that situation, yeah. Uh, even when she gets her way, it's still not going you know, in the way and at the pace that she gets to choose. You know, it's like she's not getting to drive. So he gives it to her at the wedding. Okay. But she doesn't get to drive anything else, uh, even though her belief is intact yeah. really early, um, really early in the story. And so you see this, you see something similar, a similar dynamic here where she thinks that she has the, the pacing down. She thinks she understands it all. And she makes this big, you know, act of sacrifice to help fulfill the prophecy. But, uh, Right. And is right, uh, but doesn't get to drive. Right, right. You know, she's not driving in a way that she did drive his whole life. And that, that mm -hmm. moment's gone. And it's gone ahead of schedule for her. But even there, those are all examples of little character, like horns and dilemmas that I think could have been called out and heightened. 
Um, so Zendaya's character needs it. Yeah. Paul's character needs it. Yeah. Um, Paul's so Paul's so willowy, and she's a little bit masculine. I don't know that that ton, the the way like clearly the egalitarian way that they seem to both be. Yeah. Uh, I guess is intentional. Yep. I thought I thought Paul seemed like he pulled it off pretty well. I was wondering yeah. if they were messing with his voice throughout, but I I, I don't know. I haven't seen enough of Chalamet to to know yeah. what they were doing. But it was I was He's pretty good actually. He he seemed like don't, he nailed. Don't it. look up. He's got the best role ever. Yeah. He's a good one there. The, <laughs> yeah. the uh, so he's got range. He's another. Too. Well, that's Messiah too. So I don't know. Oh, he's kind of messianic. So I don't know if he does anything but Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Dune, Dune Two was enjoyable to me, and yet it was uh, grandiose in its curvature, like really slow yeah. turns. Yeah. And I think that some of those things needed peaks, so sure. you could get there. It, and it then there needed felt like to be flavor. Like you're just yeah tasting the same it's flavor, flavor and rhythm. And for a it, long it time. needed it needed some breaks where you're you're rising and it's undulating and it is in fact the same rhythm. I think the rhythm was effective, mm. but there have to be these punctuated moments of turn. Mm. And there's a couple of them, but there's a number of character turns where it should be a clear, like this way or that way. Throw the breaker, make your choice. Yeah, he makes his choice, then she has to make her choice, and he's betting on her to make the right choice, and she's not going to be able to forgive him for it. Because um, he's being, yeah, manipulating, yeah. And she's she's or mad, yeah. She's mad, and he's like, also, I'm going to marry somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that you brought me back, I'm going to do that too. Right. Um, and this is proving to not be at all an egalitarian relationship. Right. Um, well, was, for good and ill. A couple of things that fascinated me that I didn't think were going to that opening scene where those guys uh, go up to the top of the cliff, you know, and then get mm -hmm. shot. I, I don't know how he made that so compelling, but that opening image of just them all hiding on the dune and then some space. I, yeah. I, I thought Star Wars had ruined me for new space things, you know? I, you know, just like I've seen this a billion times, but no, yeah. something about it was. Well, it's not space. Sure. I mean, that's it's the not most space. Important thing. There you go. It's not space. <laughs> Austin, um, Austin Butler did a great job too, although who's he? I was surprised. Uh, Which is he? Fake. Uh, why am I forgetting his name? I've oh, got the, the the friend. No, the dude, the bald. Oh, Fade Rotha. Fade. I was like, Raid. What? Is <laughs> no. Yeah, Fade. Fade Rotha. So, yeah. yeah he was Butler. a scary one. Uh, I was surprised they put as much time into him to just have him die quite like that. I thought the, I thought that could have had a bigger payoff. They yeah, the fight felt very. Yeah, they needed a bigger payoff given how much they'd invested in him as a character. Same thing with the Baron's death. Yeah, you know, uh, but that I although almost, he dies like an animal is is that was yeah okay. him him getting de ballooned and falling on the stairs was perhaps one of the most satisfying payoffs <laughs> and, <laughs> and then Paul killing him so fast but then also killing Fade Rotha so fast yeah uh, I would have liked the I would have liked the Fade fight to have gone differently yeah I was wondering just what, in terms of the 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 rhythm the the musical rhythm of that particular conflict, I think, could have been handled differently. Right, because uh, well, in the book, he tries to use a poison spike on his belt, it's like a cheating functionally, yeah. like a very Fade Rotha move. In this one, I felt very much more just equals and who can accept yeah. the most pain, which is kind of Fade's whole thing is he's great at accepting pain, yeah. and Paul manages to outpain him. Yeah, but it's not. I mean, that's if we're really stretching. Yeah. It just is sort of like, it's hard, it's close, but Paul wins. Yeah. It doesn't get really much more <laughs> right. complicated than right. that. And it needed to... And I was still struggling with Christopher Walken being slightly too famous for his role, I thought, in The, in the Emperor. I thought he did pretty good. I just kept expecting things <laughs> that... <laughs> He's going to do his, it was some weird... Yeah, some shimmy. Speech some yeah. slight, you know, some <laughs> slight shimmy. <laughs> yeah, that's But possible. I realized that was my fault, not necessarily that's Christopher funny. Walken's fault. That's, that's and funny. then uh, the the worms. I When he first jumped on the worm, that actually felt i don't know if you felt like it had payoff but i thought it paid off pretty well yeah it did and i was not, also uh, you not have to really that. invest a lot of suspension of your disbelief yeah how do they get on moment. and off the worms <laughs> yeah i didn't like, know how they got the it's woman grappling in the basket. hooks oh we're pulling the worms noses up with grappling hooks so they don't want the sand to get in and then they stay up they stay up. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then same thing with her, the pregnant lady in the basket on the back of the worm. I like that. How do they get but the pregnant I, lady off the basket? They, they jump. Obviously. They roll her off? They throw her. I don't know. They've got lots of gadgets there in Fremen yeah. land, which they apparently sure. designed in their factories, which don't exist anywhere. <laughs> I, I made a mistake of reading up on some of his inspiration for it. You know, Lawrence of Arabia, peyote mushrooms, lots of other stuff that just made me wish I hadn't read up on it because his work <laughs> his work is so much better than his inspirations. Yeah, <laughs> or, <laughs> that makes sense. That I now I've shared them with you all, so... There we go. So that's Dune 2. What else? What, what was part of our movie mop-up? We're going to do... Um, uh, uh, you got to tell me about... Un- I can say Cabrini. Cabrini, yeah. I have not watched the cut that was released. And I was mostly just kind of like, eh. I liked the... I really... I mentioned on this podcast, I really liked the original trailer. Um, I enjoyed the extended cut and thought it would be improved by reduction. Um but then Angel went all in on this International Women's Day release. Oh no! See, just that's, like, that's how I was it, just like, why though? Like that's that's what I was worried about. You're not gonna, watching it. You're as, not going to get the people you think you're going to get with this, and the people that are, want to support this film, like it's almost like a deterrent. Like yeah. wait, they're going to you're gonna already be on like, edge. okay, I'm going to watch a movie about the first Jesuit woman missionary or whatever yeah. which is already you know a first yeah and, and then for you to lean in as if it's a global this is an international women's women's day. Like, yeah. okay so i mean she was she was cool she was great she had she had to battle actual sexism she had to do she had to be tough as nails right you know and and get this done in new york um and did great things so yeah all the and ingredients did great, did for great things and, and it was beautifully shot so so the ingredients for a great story are there. Why yeah. try? I just to didn't make like it? the rollout, especially because okay. I liked the first trailer so much. So, and so I've commented on the first trailer a lot, um, but I, I have not seen the cut. I've not seen the reduced cut, so I don't know how I feel about the finished film. Um, but I am curious to see it. I'm looking forward to it. No, I know it's going to be worth seeing. I'm just curious how much of the the rollout, the marketing, the marketing rollout. Uh, is reflective of some of the edits made. I don't know. I don't know if it became more International Women's Day in its reduction or if that is just imposed on the release. Yeah. So. Well, the danger would be that it becomes much more cardboard than it was, I guess. Yeah. Just much more of her line about. But still but beautifully shot and worth, yeah. and worth seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Boys in a Boat, too. I'm just yeah. going to pick your did brain you, on Did that you one. watch it? I haven't watched it you yet. Sh- okay. You should watch it. Have you read the book? Nope. Okay. Well, let's just say, child. <laughs> let's let's say that for everybody, uh, the book is mandatory. Okay, the book's really good, and the movie is is kind of striking. I told my uh, I told my wife, told my kids that it's kind of like having a really you know you eat a hamburger. And you're like, yeah, it's fine. It's not that was a pretty good burger. And then you look over on the counter and see that they'd cut the tip off of this amazing tri-tip and ground it up and made a patty mm-hmm. and, you know, thrown some American cheese on it and done this little, like. So the source material on this thing is great. Yeah. And, you, and then you're just disappointed. <laughs> you're like, why did I just eat this as a hamburger with like mediocre cheese and Thousand Island dressing? Yeah. You know, and it was fine. It was a little picnic burger. And it's pretty good. You know, and your Uncle Ralph's like, how'd you like the burger? And you're like, yeah, it was good. And you're not lying. <laughs> yeah, it's a park. Yeah. <laughs> it's a park uh, burger. <laughs> yeah. And then you go look at, it was like, wait, this was Wagyu, gold label, tri-tip. Like, why are we, why did we do this? Mm. The source material is some of the best source material of all time in terms of potential for a story. Uh, it could have competed as the best uh sports movie of all time with that source material and instead it just catastrophically came up short of that Mm -hmm. so it's devoid of suffering it basically adapted away from every single strength of the book uh (laughs) now i'm really curious but maybe we do need to read it you do yeah you do you should read it and watch it you should do fascinating and I actually, this is one I would say for anybody who's not read the book, go ahead and watch the movie first. Eat the picnic burger. He's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's fun. It's, you know, because our bar is really low as dads when we have kids. And you're like, hey, here's a clean, 
sports movie we could watch about some guys who worked hard and won. Mm-hmm. You know, they worked hard and they won. But then go read the book or listen to the audio book. Um, and it's it's really shocking to go that direction. Um, and so the one uh, one thing I'll say is that the the thing one of the things many things they miss is this toxic, poisonous, internal competitiveness in the Washington program. And there are these different boys in different boats who hate each other and competing with each other, and they're vying for the varsity boat, and they're you know falling in and out, and they're getting moved. And then three of them discover mutually that they're actually poor because they all show up at the Grand Coulee Dam to work all summer in the works projects. Uh, and these three are guys dangling on cliffs with 75 pound jackhammers. Like you're they're rappelling down cliff faces, running 75 pound jackhammers on cliff faces for eight hours a day, all summer. And these three guys were from rival boats inside that toxic program. Uh, and through this like death defying, uh, terrifying experience, they came together. Those three came together and those three got put into the lead boat together afterwards and became this unbeatable boat. Mm. And they're the Western rural poor versus this Eastern hoity toity. Yeah. Boat rowing. Mostly you know, what thing. we think of. Yeah. These guys were so backward that, you know, they're out there on the Hudson. They heard FDR's house was somewhere on the Hudson. So they went and found it and walked up and knocked on the door. <laughs> and his son let him in. They're like, hey, was the president here? And we wanted to say hi. You know, it's like it's Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're those kind of guys. When they went to the Olympic trials, which incidentally are just skipped in the story, in the film, but when they go to the mm-hmm. Olympic trials, uh, it's hot and it's humid. And so they decide to go skins. Awesome. And they're at this Princeton. Okay, yeah. they, they're, it's this Princeton <laughs> country club. Yeah. And they go skins. They win, and when they get off, the you know the chairman of the Olympic Committee comes over and is giving a speech for all the news cameras and is giving them this trophy, and they're going to go to Berlin. And the guy is just talking for too long, and so the coxswain just yanks the trophy out of his hand, and they just all walk off on camera while the guy's giving him the, the presentation speech. <laughs> it's like <laughs> these awesome. these guys these guys are Ugh. poachers, like they survived by poaching. These are loggers. These are like these are some hard Western kids and they're from here, you know? Yeah. PNW rednecks. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's our very unique breed of what we're familiar with and kind of the tough, tough, tough as nails rural poor out here who then did that. Mm. Um, and, and achieved that and hated each other and competed with each other until they got shoved into this brutal manual labor situation. And that's all what's missing. Um, that's all none of that's missing there. from the movie. None of it's there. It's they, artificially like the thing I was talking about in Dune, where they need these horns of these dilemmas, they need these moments of choice. They try to create those and impose those, but they have to manufacture them. There's so Mm. much real conflict and there's so much real suffering uh, in the, in the real story that they just omit. And so they then have to conjure up new ones. And so right beforehand, you know, Joe's gonna, he's going to quit. He was, that dude was never going to quit anything in his life. It's like he's gonna walk off. It's like, oh, oh never yeah. mind, he's not gonna walk off. And right. And on top of that, I think this their season, that one season was the rainiest season in history in Seattle that they were training it still. Like just mm. is is still the most just torrential, <laughs> frigid. Um at a friend uh, who's com- a, a friend, a friend whose comment walking out of the theater was like, well knew that was fake because being from Seattle, you know, it's like living in Seattle. They didn't rain once in that whole movie. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like the, the mm. misery and the suffering. It's all kind right. of this hallmark glow is just kind of, of nostalgia is just placed over it. And, and the very specific miserable ice dangling on your oars level of suffering uh, is mostly absent. It's not all absent, but it's yeah. mostly absent. Yeah. Uh, but the movie itself is kind of like, hey, you know, it's something fun and clean to show your kids. And these guys worked hard and they and they won. And it's a great little burger. You know, it's a good little picnic burger. Uncle Ralph, thumbs up. And then you go read the book and you're like, wait a second. What did Ralph do? <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> this could have been this could have been the best ever. This could have been amazing. This could have been a whole season. This mm. could have been a series that would have been. Yeah. 
phenomenal. And instead, it's it was just that Thousand Island American cheeseburger. Yeah. So that was Boys in the Boat. Wow. That's good. And then uh, Masters of the Air, say filter it. Not great arc-wise, but very interesting historically. Just I really enjoyed watch, watching through it for that for that reason. Yeah. Uh, what else do we need to hit? We had Cambrini, Boys in the Boat, Dune too. I mean, I think I think that was the big four. That we, we wanted to get through there. these things. All this app, like we yeah. procrastinated. I went on vacation. We stopped talking. For a here while. we are. Um, we did them. We'll catch up on the we other ones. We got through. I feel like there was something else. We got to do another lamp. Yeah, we have to. Oh, right we now, we'll just to say do, uh, we we're supposed to talk about. Um, Sorry, prison escape movie. Shawshank. Shawshank. Yeah, but great film. We can't squeeze that. We can't <laughs> squeeze that on the end. Let's go. Ahead, let's go ahead and say that Dune Two is past Shawshank. I don't know if it's still. It did pass Shawshank as the highest rated film of all time on IMDb. Dune Two did or Dune. Dune Two. Whoa. Past Shawshank. Now, is did it stay ahead? I don't know, but I saw the headline pop. Well, that's kind of that, that's kind of that crazy, out. right? Yeah. It is. I don't know if it's merited. Shawshank is. Uh, I don't think that's a pretty great little at film. all, but I, I very <laughs> much enjoyed. You know, and oh, cool part about Dune too is just watching Villeneuve or Villeneuve um, write, direct, produce. Villeneuve will met Timote. <laughs> yeah, watching him write, direct, produce something that he's loved since he was a boy. That's cool. Yeah, and I think you could feel that. Oh yeah, no, you feel that, the affection. That right there is what saved it, and what has ruined things like. He was not Lord a, of the Rings. He was not a well. I would say. <laughs> he just, Let's not open that can of tiger threw, worms. Right, he at just the end. threw a tire off a bridge into the pond. <laughs> um, I'll say that he, he's obviously not a hireling. He obviously has deep affection. Yeah, uh, but he also has some taste. Yeah, and in production design and his del his his delegation, the people he's delegated to in different roles have been fantastic. I really would like to see other edits. I would like to see particular threads edited differently, but hmm. Hmm. I, thought his, I thought his commitment to the whole was pretty clear. I think Jackson's commitment to Lord of the Rings as like a boy who loved it and grew up loving it is not a thing that is as much as I'll insult him is not a thing that I would actually pick on. I'm sure he really, really, <laughs> I'm sure he really loved the source material. I'm sure it really affected him. It's the taste. Sure. It's okay. the taste and his, his incomprehension of, of story architecture and what made the originals work okay, that, bothers, just that. that bothers me. <laughs> Whereas this is, feels more submissive to the source material. Yeah, it did. Than Jackson was. Right. He was and, not And again, Dune's, Dune's story, fun that it was serialized yeah. and then failed at, for 20 publishers, finally picked up by a car publishing. They published auto manuals mostly and it failed for them. And the editor who acquired it was fired. And then eventually over time, it's become this great thing, but started out as a real lame duck. That's kind of, it's kind of funny. <laughs> it is really funny. That's really, it's really weird that, that, that that's the story. Um, it is also, it's strange when you you take things like this and people are going to fall in love with the world and, and psychos are going to fall in love with the world. And they're going to go all in. Cult classic. Yeah, yeah. in ways that they shouldn't. Um, but it is a really striking and interesting world. And it's rare that you find innovative, like really innovative worlds that are, that feel real and whole, like right. they feel intact. Yeah. Um, and it, it has that sensation of being intact. Like yeah, there that, is a dark side to this moon. You right. know that if you go around that moon, you're going to see right. everything that's <clears throat> over there. That's never going to show up in the story, but it's all here. Everything's been built. Right. Um, and you feel that commitment in the films. Yeah. As if you ask a question, there will be an answer, even though. Yeah. Felt that about almost all of it. Yeah, very much so. So I enjoyed it. I'll probably watch it again in theaters at least once. Uh, well, no more than one more time. Um, then uh, then we'll see. There's still a few things I want to hunt down. But we'll talk about Shawshank next time. Great. And whatever else we're, we're covering. Um, there we go. But do, uh, let's see, man, what, there was something else. Scrolling through. I checked out a little of Guy Ritchie's new show. It's like, hmm. This kind of amoral and blah. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. Shogun. Oh, yeah. That, we were talking Shogun about that briefly. Shogun and Dune are both examples of right now, if 
people push out content that is male centric and really aggressively goes after committed worlds and, and reality in terms of not politicizing, not coming in and imposing current trends and sensibilities on the story. And so Shogun is not trying to be contemporary yeah. or PC at all. It's just trying to tell you the story of Japan as it was then. Right. And what it was like. A, was, a very much foreign world. Yeah. Like and alien. for this British guy who, who washes in. And then Dune's doing the same thing. He's, even though it's fantastical, even though it's fantasy, he's refusing to accommodate that world to contemporary sensibilities. And in both those cases, it's blowing up. Uh, Shogun yeah. is on Hulu, which is a little nothing, you know, just a nothing platform and compared to the giants and it's crushing in terms of streaming counts, it's crushing Netflix. You know, mm -hmm. it's actually, yeah. it's at the top and that's really, uh, striking. And so when people are trying to feminize, uh, or, or create sensitivities or impose any kind, it doesn't have to be feminization, but just impose any of our sensitivities, any of our scruples right now, any of our very, very trendy, uh, manners, like any of those that get imposed into the, the story, get posed into the content is like the kiss of death right now. People want to see worlds that are existing entirely outside of all the pressures and all the wokeness and all the, yeah. all the, the little, you know, viral manners that we have now about how you have to say this, that, the other thing. Yeah. People want to feel the fervor. Yeah. Um, and so, but it's, it's like, there's an especially deep, driven desire in the male audience to experience true escapism from this toxic moment. Mm. They want to get out of this moment that kind of, you know, is, is uh, unkind to them in some ways and just watch something yeah. wholly other experience, something wholly other with no memories and no references and no allusions to the way it actually is in their time right now. They want that full transformative escapism into a masculine ethic and into a masculine story, both Dune and Shogun are that way. And the male viewer is watching so little right now that they've been dumping games on platforms. They're trying to re-engage the male audience. Is that why Netflix dropped video games? To try yeah. to get try to get guys playing those old arcade games yep. on it? And they're so, but just the men are leaving the streamers. And it's, which is wild. Like they're just leaving. And they're trying to get the male audience back. And it's two big examples of how it's done right now are Shogun and uh, and Dune Shogun. I don't know if it has filters. If it does, it'd be clear play because it's own FX on Hulu owned by Disney. Disney has some series that are, that are filtered via clear play. Vid Angel has none, uh, nothing through Disney. So it might end up with filters. It needs a couple, um, you know, but it's, uh, it's pretty skippable too. So if you're, if you're watching it as an adult, uh, the scenes are, you can blitz it's, through. Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, that's pretty easy. And here we go. Skip, skip. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really striking how successful both of these things have been via radical escapism away from all the toxic yeah. change that's happened in our own mm. society. Also, the swords. They both have lots of swords. They both have some swords. Does Dune have a bunch of swords? The knives, yeah. The oh, they got knife. some. I mean, they the both. With, let's say they both have pointy objects. <laughs> I just. But think I it's don't key. think those are. I, wanna, I don't know that those. Are I want to watch something with swords. <laughs> okay, fine. They both have swords, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. So it's funny to see very expensive, large productions targeting male viewers, almost exclusively, yeah. targeting male viewers that then also capture the whole. Yeah, because your wife, audience. your wife will come watch it with you. I can. Adjust. She'll come take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> My wife slept really well. My wife woke up and said, wait, how did they get inside at the end? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> you missed <laughs> I tried to remember what my wife hit me and asked a question. She hit me and asked something. And I was like, I can't explain that right now. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> This just matters so much. It was like the previous two hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was just short from Christy. Yeah, she, our uh, problem is our local theater has really comfortable seats. Yeah, they so just like kick the feet up and, and you're out. Okay, that's enough. Enough movie talk for one day. Wow, we almost hit an hour today. That'll make up for having missed a week. Yeah, let's let's just pat ourselves on the back and say that we missed a week and it doesn't matter because we went for an hour. Yep. Cheers. The end. Hey, Christian Dad. Are you paying a monthly fee to let Hollywood producers pump their septic tanks directly into your living room? 
even worse, directly into your imagination and the imaginations of your children. How much darkness streams into your home every day, every week? Have you gotten too used to turning your mind off when you put your feet up? Have you invited your own enemies into your home? How much damage has already been done to you and to your family? My heart says that the way I feel most myself is to go by the name Fred. That's because I'm non-binary. Canon Plus is building a global platform with one simple goal, to create and deliver great content that will help Christian families grow stronger and more dangerous in the world. Content that will kick your brain's butt and help you bear down and step up. Content that will encourage, equip, educate, challenge, and inspire your family. Content built on the bedrock of real truth, real goodness, not fake trendy virtues. How dare you! And real, lasting beauty. Your family might already be struggling. Maybe the man of the house has been sipping too much Bud Light gospel in the basement for too long. It's day six of girlhood! But it's not too late. With thousands of audiobooks, podcasts, truth-telling documentaries, and curriculum for all ages, Canon Plus wants to help you grow stronger together with your family. There might be enemies at the gates, but there's a feast on the table to strengthen you for the fight. We want the resources we produce to help you do the real work of cultural change, becoming a lighthouse in your own community, armed with courageous joy and a faith that burns hot and bright, especially when the world would rather keep you on a cute little dimmer switch. We don't have to wallow in the world's filth. Moonlight, best picture. You ugly. We don't need to let our strength atrophy like numbed victims of some ungodly matrix leaving our families unprotected and vulnerable. It's time for Christian fathers to stop being such cultural cuckolds, well-behaved Wonder Bread winners sitting by and paying for the world to assault their families with lies. Let's get strong and grow our families strong. Let's raise our kids to be the world's worst nightmares. Smart, secure, fearless, joyful, difficult to control, and quick to laugh at lies and nonsense. <laughs> We're pushing back against the rising tide of sewage on our screens. We're pumping out antidotes to the world's poisons, but we can't do it alone. We need allies. You need allies. So consider this your invitation to join up and make things a little awkward for all our weaker brethren and church leadership. It's not that we're against anything. Who so badly want to be worldly cool kids. Help us build a streaming platform unlike any other. A platform that will challenge and strengthen Christians, mind, body, and soul, until this cultural tide begins to turn. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. And yes, this tide will turn. This ain't the Alamo. We're all gonna die, but we have no intention of losing. <sighs> Canon Plus. You don't have to subscribe, but you do have to stop sucking. <laughs>